family and welcome to Church Online. My name is Angelina Hardy and I am here to welcome you and to also navigate you a little bit around our website. First of all, if this is your first time, we are so excited that you have decided to join us and to view our Church Online service. Um, but we want to let you know that we care about you as a person. You're not just a view to us. So we want to connect you with the other people in our church. So if you could please fill out the communication form at the bottom of the Church Online page, we would love to get to know you and we look forward to meeting you soon. Also on our website, there are some resources. Um, we have resources for life groups. We have resources for teens. We have resources for kids church online. I know in our church, you know, the adults and the older boys, they watch the sermons online. But for our seven-year-old, we get him little headphones on his head and a little device that he has for himself. And he just watches church online for the kids ministry. And that way we can all have our time together as a family every Sunday morning watching church online, but he gets to do it in a way that engages him so he can learn to the best for his age. Um, so if you have little kids in your home, I highly recommend that. It's been working so well in our home. Finally, if you are part of the Wave Church family and you consider yourself part of the spiritual community here at Wave, we encourage you to tithe and you can do that online or through the mail. Um, but any way that you decide to do it, there are some directions on the website for that. However, if this is your first time, there is absolutely no obligation to give. We are just happy that you're here watching Church Online. Up next is Pastor Jason, and we are continuing in our First Peter study. But first, let me pray for us. Dear God, we are so grateful for all the blessings that you have for us in our life. Lord, we acknowledge that even in the darkest of times and even in the most trying circumstances, there is always reason to see your goodness in our life. And so, Lord, we praise you for the goodness that you do provide for us. And Lord, we pray for the message that we hear today. Lord, we pray for Pastor Jason, that the words will go come through powerfully through him. Lord, we pray for our hearts to receive those words. And Lord, we pray for the families that are watching for the homes that are viewing this right now. Lord, we pray for their needs to be met. Lord, we pray for peace from you. Lord, we pray for just joy from your spirit. And Lord, we pray for our country that you heal um, our land. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It happened. The unthinkable. The shift that showed our frailty. Nonetheless, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. We are separated. We are isolated. And in this world, we have trouble. Nonetheless, we take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. We are conflicted and frustrated, weary too. But nonetheless, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. We are down but not out, sidelined but still in the game. We fight for our families, we hold on to love, we strive for kindness, but the hard times get harder. Nonetheless, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We walk through adversity. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We know to whom we belong and we know where our hope lies. For he is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is and the one who is to come. It looks bleak, they say it's grim, there's a lot to fear, but nonetheless, we are strong. We are courageous. We are the church. Hey, good morning, Wave Church. Welcome to Church Online. Hey, if this is your first time at Wave, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Pastor Jason, the lead pastor here at Wave. Well, if this is your first time, we are in a study in the book of First Peter. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open it up. We're in chapter 2. We'll have the verses up here on the screen. But we've been calling this series, Dawn is Coming. Peter is writing to a church 
in crisis. They're in persecution under Rome, and instead of writing to kiss their boo-boos and coddle them, he writes to fire them up, to declare, hey, dawn is coming, there is a light in this dark world, and surprise, surprise, it's you. You have a greater calling than you could ever imagine. In fact, in this passage of scripture this morning, Peter gives the church one of the greatest halftime speeches ever. He says, look, your calling is bigger than your momentary troubles. In fact, we might want to declare that for ourselves today. Our calling as children of God is greater than our momentary troubles. We are the church, the light of the world, a light in the midst of darkness, and we need to get our eyes up, right? We need to get our eyes back on Jesus. And so that's what we're gonna do this morning as we get into God's word. We're gonna be reminded one more time of just how good God is and what he is doing in us in the midst of this world. World. Now, this last week, I was watching one of my all-time favorite movies, right? You might want to guess what that is. Maybe just take a moment with your family or friends. What is Pastor Jason's all-time favorite movie? Well, it's this one, Facing the Giants. I know it's a little bit of a corny Christian movie, but it's all about football, and I love football. And there is this scene in this movie called the Death Crawl, right? Here's a picture of it. The Death Crawl is a bear crawl where you put somebody on your back. Now, the scene, this football team was discouraged. They thought they were going to lose to their opponent that was coming up. Instead, their coach gave them an illustration to show them that they have much more in them than they could ever think or imagine. So what did he do? He blindfolded his best player had him do the death crawl and started screaming at him halfway down the uh, football field at the 50 yard line. He thought he was only going to the 50. Lo and behold, he made it all the way across the field to the end zone. He had much more in him than he could have ever thought. And family, I want you to know this. You have more in you than you realize as well. Peter declares that you belong to a triumphant people. You have a triumphant mission and we stand firmly on a triumphant hope. And so Peter wants to encourage us as the church to not give up during this season. And honestly, it's, that's been my heart for us as a church as well, to not get distracted uh, by all the discouraging realities of our world, but to keep going, to not feel sorry for ourselves because God has something great for us to do. So hear the word of God this morning, his greatest halftime speech to a church in crisis. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Take a look. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct amongst the Gentiles honorable. So when then they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. What is Peter saying? Don't give up. There is something beautiful that God is doing in you. Now, I don't know about you, but 2020 feels a little bit like a death crawl, right? We are crawling through this year and we don't really know when it's going to end, but there is something that God is doing in us. And I hope you're ready to dig into God's word this morning. You know, if you read through the entire book of 1 Peter, you're going to notice that there is a theme that begins to pop out. And the theme is simply this. Peter is saying, you have a calling. You're called by God to a special purpose. In fact, I want to pull out three callings that every believer has. Maybe you've heard this conversation before. You might have heard a friend or a family member or somebody in church saying, man, I feel called to do this. Well, there's actually three callings that we as believers have. Okay, the first calling is an eternal call to Christ. All of us as followers of Jesus are called to love and worship and follow him. In fact, humanity was created to glorify God. That is our eternal calling. Whether you know God or not, that is what we have been made to do. We have an eternal calling to Christ. Secondly, we have a temporary calling to an assignment. Now, your gifting that God has given you is different than my gifting. And so God places us in different circumstances and seasons and historical times 
that we might fulfill a calling that God has specific to us. He has work for us to do. Thirdly, as we saw in this passage, we also have a daily calling to be different, to be set apart, to be holy, to stand out amongst an unbelieving world, to lead people to Christ, a calling to be different. Now, when we think about our calling, we might think about, well, what do I need to do? Right? We might ask God, God, what do you want me to do? That might even be a question that we've been asking ourselves in this pandemic. We just kind of don't know what to do. And we've been praying and asking God, how should we respond or what choice should I make? Should I send my kid to online school or to school in person? God, what are you calling us to do? Now, what's fascinating is that Peter doesn't start with what we're to do because God never starts with the do. He always starts with the who. God starts with the who before he gets to the do. God is far more concerned with who you are than he is concerned with what you do. Because if you don't get the who right, the do will never be right. God is more concerned with the motive of our hearts, not just our outward behavior. He's concerned with the who that leads to the do. Because if we get the who right, who we are, the do is naturally going to come. In fact, I want you to write this down. It's called the who before do principle. It simply is this. When you know who you are, you will know what to do. When you know who you are as a child of God who is loved by the Father, we will know what we're to do. And so Peter is writing to a church that's distracted. They've they've forgotten who they are in the midst of their momentary problems. Peter is saying, hey, look, I want to remind you, you've got more in you. In fact, you have the Holy Spirit in you that tells you that we could do more in Christ than we could ever think or imagine. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, he gives us some qualifiers of who we are. Your chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Now, you have to understand, Christians back then and even today have been misunderstood. And so there were some rumors going around about the early church where they were misunderstood. In fact, some of those rumors were that the church was superstitious, that the early followers of Christ, uh, that they believed in all of these miracles and they prayed and God would do miraculous things. And so many people thought they were uh, magicians or sorcerers or witches. Now they weren't, they were misunderstood. Another rumor is that they were incestuous because they had these things called love feasts and they called each other brothers and sisters in Christ. Now that was not at all what was going on. They were misunderstood. Christians, they were also often called cannibals because they ate and drank the blood of Jesus Christ. The church has always been misunderstood. And in the midst of that, Peter says, I want you to understand something. You are a chosen race. Circle, highlight, underline the word race. Now, that's a politically divided word, right? That's an ethnically divided word. That's a a hurtful word for some race, right? The racial division that we've experienced in our country. I want to explain a little bit what God is saying here, that we might have a different picture of what this chosen race means and how it might redeem our world today. You know, for hundreds of years, Israel had hoped and prayed for the restoration of their nation. There was a day that God rescued them out of Egypt But then they fell back into captivity, and so they prayed once again that there would be what was called a second exodus, a time when God would rescue them from their oppressors. This time it was Rome and not Egypt. Now, you may not realize it, but Peter is using exodus words. We're going to look at this. He actually quotes from Exodus. And we saw last week that God's plan has always been to create a people that love him and walk with him and represent him to the world. Now, for the Hebrew people, they were a race, a chosen race that was rescued. But God said that through Jesus Christ, he is doing something different. We're now this chosen race. Membership into God's family has nothing to do with your ethnicity or the family that you were born into, but by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, you might want to write this down. The kingdom of God is anti-racist. Right? It has nothing to do with color. It has nothing to do with the color of my skin or the money in my pockets or the political leaning that I might have, but about my faith in Jesus Christ. The church, this chosen race, is a diverse people 
with multiple ethnicities and skin colors and economic backgrounds and political statuses all joined together because we love Jesus and want to live for Jesus. Our citizenship is simply because we have placed our faith and allegiance in our King Jesus Christ. The glory of God now shines through a diverse makeup of people in the church as we live in unity and diversity in the midst of the church. It is a different picture to our world. In fact, let me tell you this. The gospel is the only way that we can explain how people that are so radically different can come together and love each other as a spiritual family and worship Jesus together. That is what it means to be a chosen race. And so we gather together with our brothers and sisters of Christ across racial lines and barriers to declare that God has a better plan. Family, that is what we get to be a part of. That is part of our eternal calling. In fact, take a look at this. Peter quotes Exodus 19. Take a look at what it says. Now, therefore, God is speaking to Moses. He says, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession amongst all the people. For all the earth is mine and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You have a purpose. I'm going to use you. These are the words that you shall speak to my people, Israel. Now, we might have heard the story. God miraculously saved the Hebrews out of bondage and slavery in Egypt. Moses walks into Egypt, tells Pharaoh, let my people go. There's the 12 plagues. There's the parting of the Red Sea. The Israelites are now wandering through the desert, and they come to a place called Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, Moses goes up to the top, and God meets there, and God gave Moses this message. Go tell the Israelites, you're mine. I'm going to use you. I have chosen you. You have a calling, and I'm going to show you what that calling is. Now, imagine Moses comes down and tells the Israelites, God has saved you. He has chosen you. Now, they're excited. They're all awestruck. But I kind of wonder, do they really believe it? I mean, years of slavery and oppression don't just go away overnight, right? There were some labels that have stuck. Now, they might have believed maybe somewhat, okay, I'm a chosen race. I'm God's royal priesthood. But, but they slowly grew into these things. And the truth is, for, for all of us, we might read some of these descriptions today, and this is it absolutely who God sees you as, as members of His church, but we might not totally feel that. And I just want you to remember that it was not Israel and their actions that made them God's chosen people. It was God's action that made them His chosen people. It is not what you do or what I do. It is what God has done to make us His. In fact, you might want to write this down. Our identity as Christians is received. It is not earned. It is a gift. It is given to us. It is received. And as we grow up into spiritual maturity, we start living into that identity. And as a result, Christians, we are being called into an eternal calling to live out that identity as children of God. Now, we might not realize this, but Peter is connecting Christians to God's promise to restore and renew Israel, where Jesus is now a new and better Moses, and the church is now a new and better Israel. He says that you are a chosen race. Secondly, he said that you are a royal priesthood. Royal simply means, hey, you have an honored position. You know, it's always been God's heart for Israel to reflect or mirror his glory to the nations that they would be a signpost pointing to the goodness of God that all of the other nations would see there are no other gods like Yahweh. In the kingdom of God, we are told that we are all priests, that there is no special reserve role for, for Pastor Jason compared to anybody else. No, all of us are priests. Now, we might want to ask, well, well, what are the things that priests do? In fact, in, in scriptures, we see that they do two things. And You might want to write these down. One, priests bring the reality of God to earth. And secondly, they bring the blessings of God to earth. Let's look at the first one here. Priests bring the reality of God to earth. You know, as a priest, you have full access to God. In the Old Testament, priests served in the temple. They would take the sacrifices. They would bring them into God's presence once a year and they would uh, be intercessors for the people, for the atonement of their sins. And in that temple, there was a giant curtain that would separate God 
from man. It was meant to show that God was holy, that he was powerful, that he was mighty, that he should be revered and feared. But we're told that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that his his body and his blood was an eternal sacrifice. There's no longer any need for any other sacrifice to be made for the atonement of our sins. It was through Jesus Christ. There's no longer a sacrifice that needs to be made. And when Jesus died, the scriptures declared that the curtain in the temple was torn in two. It was symbolic that the separation between God and man was paid for, and now we have access to the Father. And so as children of God, as royal priests, we have access to God. We see the realities of God on this earth, and we have the privilege to show an unbelieving world that's God at work. You know, the other day I was talking to my neighbor and he was telling me about a series of events to keep their family healthy and safe. And he goes, man, that's just incredible luck. And I started laughing. I said, that's not luck. That's God. That's God's hand on your life. Whether you believe in him or not, he is caring for you. We have the privilege to do this every day to point to our friends and our family. That's God's blessing right there. That's God in your life, whether you recognize it or not. We have the privileged place to bring the reality of God to earth. Secondly, oh oh man, it gets so good. Priests bring the blessings of God to earth. This is our calling, a temporary calling. We go into places where God has placed us to bring God's blessings. You know, priests are called intercessors, right? They represent God to man and and man to God. And the reality is we're not just going to serve Jesus today, but we're told we're going to serve him for eternity. In Revelation 5.10, it says, You, God, have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. We are mediators of God's blessings. In fact, we might say it this way, that we are the conduit by which God's blessings come into this world. Write this down. Circle it, highlight it, underline it. As God's priests, I have been called to be the source of God's blessing to my world. That is your calling. Wherever you go, you are the conduit, the source by which God's blessings come into our world. This is our temporary assignment. But as long as you are in this world, I want you to know this. You are that source. You are the source of blessings to your husband. You're the source of God's blessing to your wife. You're the source of God's blessing to your kids and your family and your neighbors and your co-workers and even your enemies and those in need and those that are hurting and the widow and the orphan, those that are oppressed. We are the source of God's greatest blessings. Because of you, people have been blessed. This is our temporary assignment. And family, there's going to be a day where God's going to say, okay, it is now time for Jason to come home. And I'm going to stand before God, and you will stand before God, and I pray that we hear those words from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you resources, I gave you talents, and you used them to be a blessing for those that I put in your life. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, there's no greater joy than knowing that we're right where God wants us to be, and that joy is not just some for, some, for some eternal time. It's for right now that we live our eternal calling, worshiping Jesus and knowing this very moment I'm bringing forth God's blessings. There is a tremendous joy that God creates in us. We have an eternal calling to Jesus Christ. We have a temporary assignment, a calling to bring forth God's blessings into the world. And then thirdly, we're called to be different today, a daily calling to be different. Peter says this, you are a holy nation, a people set apart. A people's who allegiance is not our president or our political party or even our physical country, but to our King Jesus and our heavenly home. A people called to be different. And the reality is, the more you look like the world, the less effective you will be in your calling. In fact, write this down. I am called to be different than the world for the sake of the world. You know, geographically, Israel, if you look on a map, they are situated perfectly to make a giant impact. Rome is to the north, Egypt was to the south, Arabia was off to the east. They were right at the middle of a trade hub. So many different ethnicities and cultures and religions would come through Israel. They were perfectly situated to make a massive impact, but they didn't. They failed. 
And the reason why they failed, if you read the Old Testament, there is cycle after cycle, is that they got distracted with the blessings of God rather than being the blessing of God. God had poured forth his blessings. They lived in a land of milk and honey. In fact, Moses even warned them before they crossed over the Jordan into the promised land, don't get distracted by the blessings of God. You have a mission that I'm sending you on. Family, we are also in danger of the same temptation. God has poured his blessings into our lives, and we as the church are poised to make a difference in this world. But don't get distracted by the blessings of God. And forget that we are called to be the blessing of God because we are a people for his own possession. And our mission is to continually proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In fact, I've heard this point many times before and I love it. It simply says this, that you are God's plan A and there is no plan B. The church Empowered by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, is God's plan A, and he has no plan B. We belong to a triumphant people who have a triumphant mission, and we stand firmly on a triumphant hope. God's purpose for redeeming you was not simply for your enjoyment, but that you might give glory to God. To proclaim that God's excellencies are overwhelmingly beautiful. They bring joy on our life that we might declare in every season, man, look at what God is doing. Look at what God has done. I know it might be bad. I know we might want to give up, but God is doing something. We are God's plan A and there is no plan B. You know, if you remain silent, if I remain silent, if God's church remains silent, we're told even the rocks will cry out in God's glory. And last time I heard, I haven't heard any rocks crying out because God's church is doing what we have been called to do. We are proclaiming God's excellencies. Now, I know that there is a temptation out there for many of us as Christians as we're looking at this world and the mess that it is to simply just remove ourselves from it, to maybe go into hiding Uh, to remain silent, to stay disengaged because, man, there's a lot of crazy people out there and they're making a mess of this world. And there's this cancer cult, cancel culture where if you say anything wrong, you're going to get socially shamed. And so maybe I should just hide. You know, throughout history, there have been some Christians that do that. They go off into hiding, they become aesthetics, or they go into monasteries to simply remain pure away from the world. In today's modern age, maybe it's just that we hide our families or our children away to protect them from the world. We think, oh, we got to protect our kids, but we forget that those very children that we often try to protect are the next generation of priests that are called to declare God's excellencies to the world. They are God's plan A for the future, and there is no plan B. Our calling as parents is to raise up children that will be effective priests to be a light for the world in the midst of darkness. In fact, Jesus said, you don't light a light and put it under a basket, right? Take a look, Matthew 13, he said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill that cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The exact same words that Peter used. That they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, when you realize who you are, isolation and silence is not an option. When we realize who we are, we will know what to do. Our mission, our calling, flows out of our identity. We will not disengage. We will not stay silent. We will not apathetically hide in our homes until maybe the mess goes away. It only takes the reality of recognizing what Jesus has done to get us stirred up to declare his excellencies. Because once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When you know who you are, you will know what to do. Now, I want you to understand this. God is more concerned today with who you are before he is concerned with what you do. Because if you don't get the who right, the do will never be right. But family, if we get the who right, if we claim these truths as our own, if we own these as our identity, the do will naturally come. 
Peter says, therefore, beloved, verse 11, I urge you as sojourners or pilgrims, people who do not belong here as exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct amongst the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation, the day that Jesus returns. What are we going to do? We're going to live into our calling. We have an eternal calling to Jesus Christ. We have a temporary calling to bring the blessings of Jesus to this earth. And we have a daily calling to be different. So daily, we are going to wage war, not against the unbelieving world, but against our flesh that either wants to run and hide or go fight the world. We have to realize that our unbelieving world, that is the mission field. And we are going to live properly amongst them. Now notice, Peter doesn't say, convince the world to believe what you believe. Right? Never does he say that. He goes, no, 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 no. That's not how we do it in God's church. Instead, our behavior, how we behave, how we respond to crisis, to pandemics, to economic hardship is going to show them what we believe. We're going to live honorably. And it starts by earning credibility, not with what we say, but by what we do. We have to start being the people of God that God has called us to be. You know, I used to have a football coach uh, that used to say the best defense is a good offense. Now, I love that quote because I was a wide receiver at the time, and that meant I was going to get the ball, right? The best defense is a good offense. You know, for Christians, we spend often way too much time trying to figure out how to defend our faith. Right? We think, well, if I speak to my neighbor, they might ask me a question and I might not know how to defend it. The reality is we need to just get out there and start living our faith. That is the best defense. They are going to see the fruit of your life. You don't need to have any words. Peter says, live in such a way that when they criticize you, by the way, that is a scriptural promise. If you are living for Jesus, you will be criticized for your faith. Which means if you are not being criticized for your faith or have never been criticized for your faith, then maybe you're not living out your faith. That might be a hard pill to swallow, but that is a scriptural truth. If we're living for Christ, we will be misunderstood, just like the early church. And when they criticize you, Peter says, your good deeds are going to speak for themselves. Not your Instagram posts, is not your Facebook posts, but simply the way that you live. God has called you to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a possession for himself to declare the glory of God, because when you know who you are, you will know what to do. And family, listen, when the momentary trials of life come, we will no longer see them in fear, where we need to overcome or we need to simply survive, but we will see them as part of the calling that God has given us to declare the goodness of God. The last point, maybe a little vision statement for yourself to hold on to this week is this. Your life is too valuable. Jesus Christ died. He gave up his life that God gave his son for you. Your life is so valuable to God that he would do that. Your life is too valuable. And your calling is too great and your God is too good to give your life to a lesser calling. Your life is too valuable. Your calling is too great and your God is too good to give your life to a lesser calling. So family, how do we respond this morning to God's word? You know, if you are a follower of Jesus, maybe we can all admit that, you know, when we hear these words, one, I hope it pumps you up. I hope it encourages you. I hope it's a bit of a shot in the arm to get you to continue to go to not give up. But the reality is that, that maybe we can admit this morning, you know, I think I've been distracted. There's been a lot going on in this world. I've been distracted by maybe worry or fear or just trying to make decisions in the midst of an ever-changing world. And I've gotten distracted. I, I've forgotten the calling that God has given me. And maybe in this moment, we could just simply go back to what we believe about Jesus Christ, that he actually did come to this earth as the Son of God to die for us. And we can believe the words that Jesus gave to Peter and to the church that we are his chosen race, 
his beloved possession, a royal priesthood that he is giving us a calling. And we can confess today that I believe that I'm going to live my life for Jesus Christ and not for a lesser calling. Now, for some of you listening, the reality is you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, there was a day that Peter stood amongst 3,000 people his Jewish brothers and sisters, and he said, Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is no salvation through anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ that we come to eternal life, life with God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so this morning, maybe in this moment, you could simply admit You know what? I have not been living for God. I've been living for myself and it hasn't gotten me anywhere. In fact, I've been wondering what has God put me for on this earth. And this morning you heard God put you on this earth to give him glory, to be in relationship with you. And so this morning you can simply admit I'm a sinner. I've lived my own way away from God. And then today I believe that Jesus Christ is indeed the son of God who came to die on a cross for my sins that I might have eternal life. And we can confess or place our faith in Jesus Christ, inviting his Holy Spirit to come into us that we might live out the calling that he has for us. Family, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the value that you see in us. When the reality is that we don't often see that same value as we look at ourselves in the mirror. Lord, you have chosen us. You have made us your royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession to declare your wondrous deeds. Lord, we are the source of blessings to this world. Lord, we are your plan A and there is no plan B. And so this morning we just admit, Lord, we've been distracted. We've forgotten who you've called us to be. And this morning, once again, through your word, you have shown us, Lord, we believe that we indeed are your children. Lord, we believe in who you say we are Lord, and we pray you would continue to put us in opportunity to bring forth your blessing in this world. And today we confess our need first and foremost for you, you, Jesus, to heal us, to heal our land, to heal our division. Lord, may we be a church that is united, that proclaims your gospel, that is unashamed of who you've called us to be. Lord, that we might not forget the mission that you've given us to bring people far from God into your family. And so today we confess our need for you, God. Jesus, we surrender our life to you. You are our king. We give our allegiance to you. Lord, lead us into the calling that you have for us today to be different, Lord, to be a blessing. Lord, lead us into eternity with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, family, I love you. I am proud of you. I'm so excited for where God is leading you and your home and your calling in this world. Well, this morning, maybe there was a couple different ways that you've responded. For some of you, maybe you've said yes to Jesus Christ for the first time, and we would love to know about it. In fact, right on our connection card you can mark today, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ, and we will contact you and help you take some next steps. For some of you, maybe you just have some things that you need prayer for. We are a praying church, and we want to pray for you, and so there's a place where you can simply write down a prayer request. For others of you, you are doing life alone, and I want to encourage you, it's time to get into a life group. We have life groups that meet digitally all throughout the week where believers gather together. We pray for each other. We encourage each other because we are not alone in this. We are together in this, living out our calling to be a light for the world. For the rest of you, I love you. I cannot wait to see you back here next week for Church Online. God bless. Have a great week. Live out your calling. You are a blessing to your world.